2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Now, as Paul's writing this to Timothy, 2 Timothy is a little more personal than 1 Timothy is. Paul, his days are numbered, and he knows it. He's going to be beheaded soon. And I don't know if, if Timothy, he was a spiritual father to Timothy. And now Tim, that young pastor, that young minister, is going to be facing life without his spiritual father. And so, as he's writing this to him, he's telling him, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So most likely, Timothy was wrestling with what was transpiring, what was getting ready to happen. What's going to happen to me? He's going to be gone. I mean, put yourself at that place. So those, you've had those in your lives that really meant a lot to you, and all of a sudden life changed drastically when they were there no more. And so Timothy's dealing with that. But, you know, we all deal with this, don't we? We live in a world that's full of challenges. And it's more trying today than it's ever been. You look at all that's going on and how overwhelming it seems. But God reminds us, but he has not given us a spirit of fear. See, fear doesn't come from God. And yet we see fears written all through the Bible. Why? Because it's so in our nature to fear. Even the 23rd Psalm, so what's to say? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Huh? Oh, we have to learn to live in that place, don't we? No matter what we're facing and how overwhelming it seems, how much in turmoil it seems, to understand and know that we're not doing this alone. He's, he's there with us. These challenges and these trials and everything, so much uncertainty today. You look around the world and there's those that saying we're going to drop nuclear bombs and you got all of this stuff that's going on. But this is a powerful reminder that we need to hear and to be able to understand this. See, there's no end of things that brings us great fear in this life, but this passage reminds us that God has given us the power to not only face the challenges, but to overcome them. Not within ourselves, but within Him. Second Timothy 1, 6, I kind of got this backwards, should have probably started with 6 and went to 7, we're going 7, 6, okay? He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. See, I'm like, and he said, laying on of my hands. Even when we commissioned, I don't know how many if you were here when we commissioned those to go to Nepal, and I'm so glad to see Pastor back and. Zach back, and those that you all came home, and it sounds like it went very well. Anxious to hear how that went. And we commissioned them to go by laying hands on them, and as we laid hands on them, that God put his hand on them, and then they'd be able to go and minister the gospel. He's reminding Timothy of these things, and he's telling him, this gift that God has put in you, stir it up. That's what the King James, the new King James says, to stir it up. Some of your translations will say, set it on fire. 
Oh, if ever a time that we need to be able to have the Lord set our community on fire, it's now. But first, it's got to set us on fire, stir us to move, stir us to be the people that he'd have us to be, that with that gift that God has given us, he's reminding Timothy of the gift that the Spirit of God has given. That's where it comes from. And every one of us has giftings. Every last one of us do. Don't think, well, I didn't get one. Oh, don't let the enemy steal that away from me because you have a gifting. If you know the Lord, you have a gifting. Oh, may we find out what that is, that God could use us to touch into other people's lives. The message is clear. God has given us a gift. And the expectation is that Timothy and us today would put that gift into practice. We aren't to sit on it, but we're to stir it up or fan the flames of our giftings. We need a holy boldness that comes from God. There's too much timidity in the church today. We get afraid to speak up. We back off. We let fear get in the way. And the enemy robs us of that which God wants to do in and through us to the people we come in contact with. Romans 12.3, and I'm just giving you the tail end of Romans 12.3. It says, God has dealt, dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ and you know him as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a measure of faith. You have a gifting. It goes on to say in that same chapter 12 in verse 6, it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given. See, we all have different gifts. And God has put us all together for that purpose, to be able to all bring our gifts, be able to use those giftings to be able to touch the world around us for Jesus Christ. Oh, may he set us on fire and help us, oh Lord, to set this community on fire in Jesus' name. Paul further explains this gift by contrasting of what it isn't. Christians are often tempted to be timid, to shrink in fear. Paul's reminding Timothy that he need not be afraid. Why? Because he has the Spirit of God. So what do we fear? We should have nothing to fear. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says this. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You have the Holy Spirit not only living in you, he's sealed in you. He's not coming out. He's sealed in you. And God has done that, that he would you be able to use his people work in and through us to touch the world around us. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? I like verse 14. It says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Who is the guarantee? The Holy Spirit that's sealed within you. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's you and I, guys. We are that purchased possession. Jesus went to Calvary's cross, shed his blood, and paid the sin debt, and he has purchased us. We belong to him. Till the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We sing a song called Hallelujah. This is a hallelujah moment. Huh? He's the guarantee. See, that when he started in us, he's going to finish. See, too often we think it's about us. And it's not about us. Oh, that we would not be timid, be afraid. 
Have you ever had an opportunity to speak and say something and you didn't take it? I'll be first to admit I have. Huh? And then later, you know, just, you know, I sorrow over that to say, Lord, I missed that. And it was right there and I knew it. And I just didn't speak up. Oh, God, may we speak up. May we speak up. See, fear traps us. Have you ever had something so fearful or bad happen in your life that it, 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 it so snares you that you can't move one way or the other? You're trapped in, you're trapped in fear. I've experienced that over, lived long enough. I've experienced some of that. And it's a terrible place to be. And if I may had to say, God, I just can't deal with this. I've got to let go of this thing and just put my trust in you. You see, sometimes, not always, be careful, watch what I'm going to say, but sometimes procrastination is the best thing to do. Other times it's not, okay? But there's sometimes it's better just to leave that thing alone and not do anything, and God will work it out. But that does not always work that way. We have to have the wisdom to know the difference. Huh? But fear traps us. It enslaves us. It keeps us from living the life that God has for us. Christians need not be a slave to fear. You see, he did not give us a spirit of fear. But there is a spirit of fear, but it comes from the enemy. It's, a, it's, a de- it's actually a demonic spirit. That can sometimes, if we listen to those voices, can ensnare us to the point we can't do anything. But we need to understand that that does not come from the Lord. Fear does not come from the Lord like that. And when you experience that, we need to be able to say, get behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name. I'm not listening to that voice anymore. It's not always easy to do, though. And why is that? Christians need not to be a slave to fear because our God is bigger than all those things. There is nothing that can be thrown our way that he cannot overcome. And that is something that is very powerful to understand. Be able to hold on to that. Paul himself dealt with this in Romans chapter 7. And I know there's a lot of controversy on those verses. Some will say, well, in Romans 7, when he wrote that, that he wasn't a believer yet. I'm going to get into that argument. But what he was saying in there is the things that I know I should be doing, I don't. And the things that I know I, sh- I, I shouldn't be doing, I do. And then he says this about himself. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Notice what he says, who. He doesn't say what will deliver me. Who will deliver me? Jesus is the only one that can deliver us. But may I be really honest? As a believer, I've done that very thing. To be able to just point and say, well, that's because he wasn't saved yet. To make an excuse for what he did. How, how easily sin can beset us and it can ensnare us. You, know, you think Apostle Paul and how well he, how God used him. And he's saying, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Why? Because he knows who he is. He knows how he is. Who will deliver me? It's Jesus. That's the who from this body of death. And I know it's so, you know, we're terrible sometimes. I heard a preacher say one time, we're the only army in the world. The Christian army is the only army in the world when one of the soldiers fall that we shoot and kill our wounded. Think about that one for a minute. 
We're supposed to get alongside them and lift them up and to be there for them. But instead of, oh, no, I knew they were like that. Huh? Oh, no. See? See? It's coming out now. We, and there, we wound them even more so. That's not how it's supposed to be. And that's why so many come to church and so many come in. And this is the place we should be. If the sick and the broken and the wounded can't come here, where do they go? Huh? Jesus is the only answer. And we got to remember that. And so we come so many times with smiles on our faces, but behind that smile is pain. Behind that smile is hurt. That some, sometimes it's just overwhelming. But we put on that false face. Because we don't want anybody to understand to think there's something wrong with us. Newsflash, there's something wrong with every last one of us. Huh? Come on. We're all broken. If it wasn't for Jesus and what he's doing in our lives, we'd be truly a mess. But he came to not only pay the sin debt at Calvary's cross, he rose from that dead. He is the resurrected Lord, and he is here to lead, guide, and direct our steps. And he keeps putting my life back together over and over and over. Every time I mess up a thing, he'll say, okay, we got to straighten you out in this area. Yeah? And I'm glad for it. We live in a fallen, sin-stained world, and we all suffer its effects. And I think we do dishonor not to face that head on. Because there's so many broken people, and they look at us, they see, well, I know that they really suffer, and yet we put this face, so why are they doing that? Because we're more worried about what someone else is going to think about us than to say, you know what, church, I need you to pray for me. I need you to be there for me. I need help right now. And you know what? It's okay to ask. Because if we don't, where's the answers come from? If all the craziness that's going on in our world today, if we don't speak, speak up, if we're not the one that takes the stand, if it's not the church to be able to say, Jesus is the answer, and he will deliver you from all these things. Then where's the answer going to come from? From God's people. Yes, we all suffer its effects, and we're going to as long as we live in this life. Huh? We're... It, that's the great contradiction in our lives, isn't it? There's that part that's growing and changing and transforming, and we still live in this broken body. Huh? That's the contradiction. We face it every day. And the older I get, the worse it gets. But the good news is one day I'm going to get a brand new body. Huh? I'm going to be just like him. I don't have to worry about all this stuff anymore. Because I'm glad we can take all these things that we worry about. And I had, took a long time. You know, I used to say, yeah, well, I'm going to go give this to you, Lord. And I'd lay it all out before him. I'd say amen, and I'd scoop it all back up. Huh? Come on now. It's true. We need to learn to just say, okay, Lord, I'm leaving this with you because I can't deal with it. You know what? He knows this about us. Oh, I can't ask the Lord about that. That's not a good subject that I want to talk about with the Lord. What do you mean? He knows all about it anyway. Huh? See how silly we get? Oh. Yeah, there's this mystery it's called suffering. What can we do is to accept the mystery of suffering and realize that all of us will taste of it at some point in our lives. Every one of us is hurting at some point in our lives. We're dealing with something at some point in our lives. What we can do is just... And here's what the Bible says about it. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. 
And we do that. I remember someone, my wife has a lot of health issues. I don't know, most of you already know that. She has a lot of health issues. It's just how, how it is. She was at her mother's funeral. And you know how at the gravesite they put those little tents up and they have the coffin there and they haven't put it down yet? They put the family on that front row. She didn't want to sit on the front row. And there was a little retaining wall. It was a little shorter than this one right here. She said, I just want to sit over here on the edge of that and see from the side. And I said, That's, sit wherever you want, honey. And when she got done, when they got done, she jumped to her feet. She maybe went down this far and you heard this <laughs> like wood snapping. And she went, whoa, that came out of me. And somehow, by the grace of God and his mercy, she got through the rest of that day. And it was a big day that, you know, people come to your house, and you're, feed, you're having, feeding them, and they're bringing stuff. It's just a funeral day is a very exhausting day. And I put her, we went to bed that night, and the next morning she could not walk. When she jumped to her feet, her skeletal frame split in two. She literally split in two. And what the strange thing was, we ended up having to go out to Mayo Clinic because there was no doctor here on the West Side. We don't know what to do for her. Because they tested her and said, oh, her bones are absolutely normal. This should have not happened. Everything's in the normal range. But yet she broke. And so, and oh, for the first five, the next five years, her skeletal frame was together, but it never healed on its own. The body is usually normally starts healing when there are bones like that and it starts filling in. She stayed broken for five years, five full years. And yet she'd walk and she'd get around, yet she was hurting. I remember she's out at Mayo Clinic. She's walking down the hall with the doctor, and she broke her foot, took a step, and her foot just shattered. And he grabs her because he saw her as she was falling, and he says, let me take an x-ray of it. And he said, I, if I wasn't with you, my first question would be, did you drop a bowling ball on your foot? That's what it looked like. She just literally shattered her foot. And we just kept praying and give it to the Lord. And even doctors today will see, look at her stuff, look at her charts and see all this stuff, and they look at her and they say, how do you walk? And she'll tell them, by the grace of God. That's her answer to them. Now, the reason why I'm telling you, saying this story, because there's someone that, you know, and, and we've learned to deal with it over the years, but I, there was someone, and I'm not picking on anyone, just how we are, said, Linda, I don't understand why Jesus puts us through this kind of stuff. Do not think it's strange. Do not. Huh? If you're in the hands of God and you know you're in his hands and you're facing some great trials like that, look up. It comes from above. There's nothing we can do. And yet, my wife, I'm thank God, she's you know, still with us. All these years that went by. That's been 17 years ago now. It's been a long time. I think the first time Jeff ever saw this was right after that happened. I was pushing Linda to church in a wheelchair. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. It's been a long time ago. And today she gets around better but she still suffers a lot of pain. And what I've learned from her, she don't throw her hand up or shake her fist to God to say, and I'm sure there's times that she feels overwhelmed by it all. She's the only human, she would. But she just quietly trusts, she trusts in the Lord. And she always asks for prayer. And many of you have prayed for her for all these years, and I'm thankful. But don't think it's strange because we face these things. Look at all that Jesus went through. 
Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which you is, is to try you, as though some strange things happened to you. Not at all. Verse 13 says, but rejoice. Huh? Rejoice, even in the hardship of it all. How overwhelming it seems. Rejoice to know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice to know that one day it will all be behind us. Rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. See, that's what it's about. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Oh, what a day that's going to be. huh? What a marvelous day. You see... <clears throat> Sometimes the only way out is through. Huh? Yeah. Just keep going. Don't give up. Just one foot in front of the other and just keep pressing on. That's all we can do. Back to our text. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power. This isn't our power. This isn't something that we come up with or some searching within ourselves, you know, to find inner peace and all that. No, that's not that at all. The power source that we have is the Holy Spirit that's been sealed within us as believer and as we yield our lives to him, He changes the circumstances. He's the only one that can. Within yourself for your own strength, that's not, we don't have it. For we are weak. But you know what the Bible says when I am weak? He's what? Strong. Hallelujah. We are, without the Lord, we have good reason to fear, don't we? Huh? Huh? We don't have the power within ourselves, but it's God's power that's been sealed within us, and we need to learn to yield to that power source and say, Lord, just use me in my circumstances. Use me. And I've learned over the years, it's not the big things you do. It's the, sometimes it's just the little things. And yet how God takes them and uses them and transforms people's lives. It's God's power. And all, it goes on to say, and of love. The Spirit of God doesn't give us power, just power. He gives us also love. And the love that he gives us is far different than the love that we come up with. See, too often the love that we have has strings attached usually. Huh? But when we can begin to love and love others and love those that have needs and be able to be there and be that person that God would have us to be, that's when the people's lives will say, they've got something that I don't have. Huh? And I want that. I remember years ago in the church I pastored in Huntington Park, California. It was my first church. We had a skid row ministry in Los Angeles. And they had quite the setup. And they had a lot of people that showed up. And the, the deal was you had to go to church first. Then they fed you. Okay? You don't go to church, guess what? They didn't get a meal. Okay? They learned real quickly. And I was remembering in the, in the, in the church group that it was, not picking on any denomination or any group, religious group, because they all, you know, they, they, they were teaching the gospel. They were teaching it. But they were a little more conservative than we were, okay? And so it was a Methodist group. But they loved the Lord. They are doing a great work there. And I remember this black guy it was about three rows back. And I started speaking and started talking. And he says, I don't know where he's from, but that's a Baptist fan for you. <laughs> he was shooting arrows at the Methodists. I said, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> 
But later, that, that, that night, after I gave an altar invitation, he came and rededicated his life to Jesus Christ. And the last that I heard, when he came over to Arizona, I still checked on him every so often. So a lot of years went by. But he stayed there at that ministry. He got his life cleaned up. He got off of drugs. And he was now ministering to others in the exact same way. Huh? Why? Because the Lord used this crazy Baptist minister to have a little too much ump in him. But for some reason, it connected with him. And God used it to change his life. Oh, if we would just do what we're supposed to do. How he'll use us. How he'll use us. Jesus says the next yes, Jesus says the world will be able to identify his followers what? By their love. When you love that way, when it's a God love, it's a God given love. Jesus sums up the entire law into two commandments. This is in Mark 12, 30 and 31. Love God and love those around us. Huh? That's what we're told to do. And we still mess it up. Uh huh? Yeah, we still mess it up. And lastly, he says he gives us a sound mind. The Spirit of God gives us self control to be able to do what he would have us to do. Many are not only a slave to fear, but they're a slave to their own desires. And sometimes we get this awful notion, well, we're free, I can do anything I want. Well, you can, but it's some things it's just better not to do. Huh? Huh? Come on now. And they become slaves to their desires. They think they're all free because they can do whatever they want but they're actually entrapped, controlled by those fleshly wants. Followers of Jesus do not need to be a slave to anything. Huh? Because he's our power source. We're overcomers in Jesus Christ. Through the power of God, we... Break free from the things that once ruled our lives. You know, we're not no longer trapped and hooked by those things anymore. We don't need to be tossed around by our impulses. We can live in the freedom that God has for us in Christ. And I want to close with this. If you get nothing else out of this, I want you to remember this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus.